What's up guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we are taking a look at the entry level or the cheapest SKU in the Ryzen family, which is the R7 1700. If you guys missed my 1800X versus 6900K video, go ahead and check that out. I'll put it in a card somewhere. Uh, but this is more so about that entry level R7 chip that a lot of you guys are probably gonna have your eyes on because it is at a lower price point of just $330 MSRP, that is US. Uh, and that pricing also puts it right in line to compete with Intel's KB Lake Core i7 7700. K, uh, which is their flagship chip within that family. So we're going to be st uh, stacking those two chips up against each other today in a series of seven different games to really get an idea of which one is the better deal or best bang for your buck if you are going to be building purely a gaming PC. Now, uh, the specs of the 1700, interestingly enough, are very similar to that of the 1800X, uh, but obviously for significantly cheaper. Uh, we still got the 8-core, 16-thread count, um, the combined 20 megabytes of L2 and L3 cache. Uh, the only two Two big things that are different here uh, between those two chips is the out-of-the-box frequency. So we're seeing a base clock of 3 gigahertz uh, with a boost to 3.7 on the 1700 uh, and a 65 watt TDP. That's significantly lower than the 95 watt TDP of the 1800X, which is already a lot lower than something like the 6900K. So hopefully we're going to be able to take a look at thermals uh, just a little bit later on in this video and see just how much cooler uh, this chip is than, say, the 7700K, especially if we're going to be overclocking both of those. Speaking of overclocking, I was curious to to see what kind of frequency we could hit with our 1700 uh, by tweaking things in the BIOS. And sure enough, we were able to hit 4.0 gigahertz at 1.365 volts. Now, if you remember in the 1800X video I did, the stock V core of that chip is 1.35. So I decided to dial it in a little bit further this time around because I really wanted that nice, even four gigahertz mark and we were able to do it. It's rock solid stable. If you're willing to dial in a manual overclock, you can probably get similar performance with the 1700 as you can with the 1800X as, as we see from this 4 gigahertz uh, overclock as well as the gaming results we're about to see in a bit. As for the 7700K being the overclocking champ that it is, we were able to take that to 5 gigahertz quite easily with about 1.4 to 1.41 volts in the BIOS. So uh, that was all fine and dandy. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of our testing hardware. On the AMD test bed, I'm using the exact same hardware that I did on the 1800X setup, with the exception of the CPU, of course. We've got that Noctua cooler that was provided to me by AMD themselves, as well as the MSI X Power gaming titanium on the 370X chipset. We've also got 16 gigs of Corsair Vengeance LPX DDR4 3000, as well as a GTX 1080 Founders Edition running at stock frequencies. Our boot drive is the SX900 from ADATA, that's a 512 gig disk, and our power supply is a 1600 watt unit from LEPA. For our 7700K Intel testbed, we're using a Hyper 212 uh, Turbo from Cooler Master as our air cooler. Both of these coolers, by the way, uh, their fans were maxed to 100% throughout the entirety of today's tests. We We've also got a Z270 Gaming Pro Carbon Motherboard from MSI, same memory and same graphics card as our AMD testbed that's all being uh, duplicated here, HX 750 watt unit from Corsair, and a 1TB RD400 SSD from OCZ. This thing is blazing fast, but it's not going to give us an advantage in terms of frame rates or gaming performance uh, over the SSD, the SATA 3 SSD, so just bear that in mind, it's just going to lead to uh, reduced loading times and things of that nature. But those are pretty much all the specs of what we're using today. Uh, I did want to mention that we're also using the latest NVIDIA driver, uh, which is 378.66. Additionally, all seven of the games I ran today were tested at 1920 by 1080. I threw out 1440p and 4K benchmarks altogether because I'm trying to eliminate any sort of GPU bottlenecking across the board, and that's just going to help us uh, determine which of these CPUs is actually the better deal. I know a lot of you guys who are gaming at hyper 1080 resolutions interested in getting the 1700 are really just curious to see what kind of frame rates you can get at those pixel counts. However, the only way we're going to expose uh, weaknesses between these chips is by tailoring our benchmark environment to be primarily CPU bound. So hopefully that makes sense. I didn't quite have time to test all the resolutions, so uh, you'll forgive me for being a one-man crew. Maybe that's something we can do in a follow-up video. On that note, why don't we go ahead and jump into our first benchmark, which is Doom, and this sort of sets the stage here uh, with the 7700K pulling ahead of the 1700 pretty much on the average frame rates as well as the low-end 99.99 0.9 percentile, uh, we actually saw a 9% lead with average FPS uh, going from uh, 179 on the 1700 to 195 at these on the 7700K, and that trend sort of continues with the low-end numbers as well. We see a similar result
Assault take hold in Ashes of the Singularity, with average frame rates for the 7700K being 66.6 .6 compared to the 59.8 on the 1700, which gives us an 11.3% gain on uh, the Intel flagship KB Lake. Unfortunately, I don't have any 1% or 0.1% lows for you guys uh, in this test, particularly because Fraps wasn't recording properly while I was running the preset benchmark. But this still gives us a pretty clear indication of the uh, IPC lead that we've got with the 7700K. In Battlefield 1, the 1700 keeps pace very nicely with the 7700K. You can see here we've got identical frame rates uh, on average, as well as 1% lows. There was a slight dip on the 1700's 0.1% uh, lows, but overall not too bad. Uh, very smooth gameplay experiences across both platforms. I really couldn't tell a difference. And Battlefield 1 is uh, one of the more recent titles in today's suite of benchmarks that's heavily optimized for multiple threads and cores. So I think those extra uh, four cores and eight threads on the uh, 1700 are really working in its favor for this particular test. On the other hand, leave it to GTA 5 at 1080p to expose any weaknesses of a particular chip. We see just an absolute crushing victory here with the 7700K yielding 93 average uh, or 93 frames per second on average, which is a 31% gain over what the 1700 was able to achieve at just 71 FPS. And the 1% and 0.1% lows obviously reflect this as well. It's kind of interesting because GTA 5 is such a heavily threaded application yet we're seeing such lackluster performance with the 1700, which has obviously more cores and threads at its disposal. I think a small explanation for this is that we're just seeing a more refined architecture at this point in the game from Intel as we are from AMD. Because, I mean, if you think about it, Ryzen has been in the works for four years now, which means they started developing Ryzen you know, in 2013. And I think just the fact that Intel has been reiterating their architecture every year or two uh, really has allowed them to just get into the groove as opposed to AMD still trying to find their footing. I think that could in some small way explain what's going on here. And again, we're seeing this trend continue here in Metro Last Light with the 7700K yielding 11% more frames per second on average than the 1700. And we're getting pretty low 1% uh, and 0.1% lows as well, which uh, do indicate a little bit of choppiness for our AMD chip here. And hopefully we can see some big improvements on this end in the next six months to a year moving forward because at their press event two weeks ago, AMD was very adamant about working more closely with game developers, big game developers, very similarly to how they and Nvidia already do that on the graphics side of things. Um, AMD wants to bring their CPU architecture to the game developers in order to optimize games more heavily for multi-threaded applications. So uh, who's, to, who's to say when exactly that's going to happen and what kind of impact that's going to make in the long run, but it is something to look forward to. Now, so far in our tests, we have managed to avoid any instances of GPU bottlenecking as intended. However, here we have a CPU bottleneck with Overwatch at 1080p simply because we've got a GTX 1080 and this game is just not very intensive to begin with. So that's why we see a very minimal gap across the board between both of our chips. We can safely assume that if we were to crank up the resolution and once again put, uh, put a load on the GPU, that we would probably start to see that gap widen in favor of the 7700K. The last game that we tested was Watch Dogs 2, and this is also a title that scales very heavily on all the cores. We saw an average frame rate of 84 with our 7700K, and an average FPS of 78 on our 1700, which gives us a total lead of 7.7% of course for Intel. And actually this particular test is fairly representative of the overall average frame rates rendered across all seven of our games, with the 7700K rendering 127 FPS on average, and the 1700 yielding 118. Given these figures, we can use basic maths to deduce that the 1700 on average rendered 7% fewer frames than the 7700K. And if you factor in pricing, uh, the 1700 is only 3% cheaper. So, uh, and, that, and that's at the MSRP of $330. So if we're to draw some conclusions based on these numbers, I think the data really speaks for itself. And my takeaway from these results is that if you are in the market for a gaming PC and you're building it today and you need it right now, and that PC is strictly for gaming. You're not video editing, you're not encoding, you're not live streaming, you're just gaming, and you need it today, then the 7700K is the better value. As we saw, you're gonna be rendering out seven to seven and a half percent more frames on average than the 1700, and you're only paying 10 to 20 bucks more, depending on where you get it, of course, but overall, I think that's worth it. However, what I said about the 1800X 
also applies to the 1700, and that is, if you're building a PC that's split right down the middle, you're gonna be gaming half the time and video editing, doing work st uh, workstation stuff, live streaming the other half of the time, then the 1700 is the better option, I would say. I would probably recommend, I would definitely recommend it if you are gonna be doing sort of a jack of all trades scenario where multi-threaded, heavily multi-threaded applications uh, that are non-gaming related are going to be thrown into the mix. So uh, that is where, one area where the 1700 really does shine and it is quite a deal because I think on the Intel side of things, if you were to up to a six core 12 thread part that could compete with that in that same space, you'd be looking at the 6800K, which is at least around $100 more, maybe a little bit, you know, uh, 80 to $100 more than the 1700. Alternatively, if you don't need a gaming PC right now, I would highly suggest waiting to see what other Ryzen SKUs will be offering once they launch, uh, because we don't know exactly what the price points will be. We, we know that they'll be more aggressively priced than the current stack of R7 chips. Um, those might fall more in line with your expectations and needs. Uh, also, we just don't know, like I was mentioning earlier, where the architecture, where the Ryzen architecture is headed, with uh, AMD working more closely with game developers. Who knows? We could see sort of like an RX 480 thing where even though that's more driver impl implemented, um, how the performance of the RX 480 has just kind of skyrocketed since it launched because there have been all these iterations to the drivers. Similarly, we may eventually see some nice performance gains from Ryzen as AMD continues working more closely with game developers uh, and, and sharing their CPU architecture with them in order to develop games more tailored for higher core and thread counts. But uh, I think that's pretty much gonna do it for now, guys. Let me know what you think of the results in the comments below, and also feel free to toss me a like like on this video if you enjoyed it. More tech stuff coming out really soon, guys. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Uh, you can also check out Bitwit Ultra, my new paid subscription channel where you get all my content ad-free and a week early. So go ahead and check that out. Link's in the description below. I'll put cards and stuff all over the place. But I'm gonna go ahead and get out of here, guys. Have a good one. I love y'all. Thanks again for watching and all that jazz. And I will see y'all in the next video.